so where we left was um now you see this is in the bladder we have we see this increased urgency in cystitis okay now if i if if you remember i told you that we have this we have this urinary bladder the diffuser muscle of the bladder and this is your sphincter okay this is your sphincter so we have these m3 receptors present on your diffuser muscle okay we have these m3 receptors present at this particular level so what what they do is they contract with the atropine atropine drug will contract this diffuser muscle so there are nerves okay that are that are releasing acetylcholine on these m3 receptors those nerves will take the signals to the central nervous system that the patient is having a pressure okay and the patient wants to urinate so this is how atropine will in will uh, will like increase the atropine will decrease the urgency in cystitis in the case of inflammation of bladder because when we studied uh, the um, cholinergic agonist they were increasing the urination okay they were increasing the urination and the therapeutic use was urinary retention when the patient was unable to um, hold the urine we were giving the drugs like betanicol or carbacol or pilocarpine etc etc but in for atropine we will give this drug when the patient will having excessive urination in the case of cystitis it happens so we have to decrease uh, this this effect we have to dilate uh, we have to relax this muscle the trouser muscle so that the patient will not get an urge to urinate means that we are we are stopping or we are decreasing the process of micturation micturation is um the way you urinate like micturation the feeling of urination is called micturation okay so so this is how we are stopping or we are decreasing the micturation the urgency okay so these are all the uh, organ systems and their actions okay now let's let's uh, let's study a bit more about what they have written in these notes you see block muscarinic effects dumbbells if you remember we studied this mnemonic in op okay uh, d for D for diaphoresis, that means increase sweating. U for urination, increase urination. M for meiosis. B for bronchoconstriction. Another B for bradycardia. E for emesis, that means vomiting. L for la increase lacrimation, means more and more tears. Okay. Uh, S for increase salivation, and another S for sweating. So uh, all. Okay, this D was for diarrhea, not for diaphoresis, because this is for sweating. So this is for diarrhea. Okay, so these were the um, these were the muscarinic effects. So atropine will block all these muscarinic effects. Okay, but it will not block the nicotinic effects. So this is important. It is not blocking the nicotinic effects. It is only blocking the muscarinic effects. Now, let's. Let me take you to the to here. You see, these were the muscarinic effects, the dumbbells, which were reversed by atropine. But these were the nicotinic effects at the neuromuscular junction, that is on the muscles, on the skeletal muscles. And the drug that was responsible to block these effects was pralidoxine. Okay. So you have to make sure that atropine is an antidote, but it only blocks the muscarinic effects. It will not block the nicotinic effects. This is important. Then, are we recording the lecture? Yes. Okay. Adverse effects. Now, if I talk about the adverse effects, now you see 
increase body temperature because definitely the 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 effects were increased sweating so when you will decrease the sweating because of atropine okay the body temperature will rise when you will decrease sweating the body temperature will rise sweating flows the heat of your body outside okay so you're increasing the body temperature now so by decreasing the sweating then it will increase heart rate okay because in 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 the cholinergic agonist you were seeing bradycardia but in case of atropine you will see tachycardia because it's an opposite drug again you will see dry mouth you will see dry flushed skin you will see cycloplegia in the eye you will see constipation because of decreased gut motility okay and disorientation because there are some receptors m1 that are present on the cns also okay so so these are all the adverse effects you will see so this is a mnemonic that they have made hot as a hair fast as a fiddle dry as a bone red as a beet blind as a bat mad as a hatter and fool as a flask so so in order to remember but but honestly speaking it is even more difficult to remember like this even if you remember the word dumbbells with cholinergic effects so the anti cholinergic effects will be opposite dumbbells and opposite dumbbells will be diarrhea will become constipation increase urination will become decrease urination or you can say urinary retention okay meiosis will become midriasis bronchoconstriction will become bronchodilation bradycardia will become tachycardia ms is positive so now ms is negative you will not see vomiting okay increased lacrimation will become dry eyes okay and dry and increased salivation will become dry mouth okay so dry eyes dry mouth jogren syndrome okay and then uh, increased sweating will become decreased sweating that is increased body temperature so you see all of these cholinergic effects okay become anti cholinergic effects when we give atropine okay you all of these actions are anti okay and when the dose is more or so in that case we will see these actions as the adverse effects again because when the actions become high and high they become enhanced the adverse effects become more okay so urinary retention in men with prostatic hyperplasia and hyperthermia in infants let me explain you this 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 important point okay now one of the thing which was which is written over here that it can cause acute angle closure glaucoma in elderly due to midriasis so because of the dilatation of pupil let me take you to this picture because of the dilatation of pupil the pupil is 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 this is the lens okay now the pupil is like dilating let's say for example this was the previous size of the pupil the normal one and now the pupil is in a dilated position so you the iris was previously present like this it was it was linear and it was longitudinal so it was letting the flow of aqueous humor from this sclems canal okay but when you are contracting this iris when you are contracting this iris this iris will become you are contracting this iris this iris will be like this is the ciliary body this iris will be like contracted it will become thicker and bent and contracted okay so what it will do it will block the flow of aqueous humor from this trabecular meshwork over here so in this case it will close this angle of cornea and iris when the angle of cornea and iris will become narrow this is what we call closed angle glaucoma so by the normal pupil to the uh, midriatic pupil because of the change of this normal into midriatic we are blocking this trabecular meshwork I I I guess you got my point what I'm trying to tell you is 
if you take this, if you take, if you consider this is not an open angle, if you consider this is normal, okay. So in the case of normal, you see the the iris is not that uh, contracted and it is relaxed and it's letting the humor flow. But in the closed angle glaucoma, you are contracting this iris, okay. You're pulling it back and you're blocking this flow of 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 humor. So in the elderly population. In the, in the old age people, because of the midriatic effects of atropine, if you give atropine to old age people, it will dilate your pupil and it can cause acute clo angle closure glaucoma. This is bad. This is bad, okay, for the old age people. This drug is not good. Then what happens when the when when you when the patient undergoes angle closure glaucoma the intraocular pressure will rise the intraocular pressure will rise the patient can have see this picture the the the, hu, the aqueous humor will not be able to flow in from here so it will cause a backflow in the backflow it will accumulate in this vitreous chamber and it will exert pressure on these walls also and also on the optic nerve. We have an optic nerve at this level. This is optic nerve, okay, here. So it will cause a pressure on optic nerve also. So it can damage the eyesight as well. So in the patient of, in the older patient, they already have problems with their optic nerves. So uh, this, this acute closure angle glaucoma will be bad. To them so, so you should be really very careful careful while using atropine in old people okay okay then we have urinary retention in men with prostate okay males have this uh, problem in old age which we call the BPH okay it is benign prostatic hyperplasia Okay, what happens in BPH is, say for example, this is the urethra. Males have a longer urethra, okay? And their urethra is divided into three parts too. So one part of their urethra is the one that is between the prostate glands. Say for example, this is prostate gland. So now in the case when this prostate is enlarged, it is bigger, hyperplasia hyperplasia okay big bigger size of the post prostate gland so now when this 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 prostate is enlarged its weight is more when its weight is more it will it will narrow it will narrow this urethra when this urethra will be narrow from here the urine will not be able to flow here properly so in the start they will complain of uh, pain in urination okay then they will complain of dribbling of urine like in droplets not a proper flow okay and in the higher stages of bph their urine will be blocked they will not be able to pass the urine and then they have to go surgery and the surgery for bph is terp i'm just telling you so that you may know some clinical points too okay so the surgery for BPH is TURP, T-U-R-P. We call it transurethral resection of prostate. Okay, what, what do you mean by transurethral? Like this is urethra and this is prostate gland. So we resect the prostate walls from here, like here, from inside the urethra. The surgery is performed inside the urethra and the walls of the prostate are resected. So, so that's why we say it transurethral means around the urethra, resection of prostate, like you're cutting the prostate. So that is what we call BPH. And, and this is a very, um, very small surgery. It is not too, uh, too difficult, okay? It is not too difficult. They dilate this urethra and then they do uh, TURP. And, and the patient is almost discharged in like two days. After the surgery, the patient is discharged in two days. So it's not it's not a bad surgery. It's a good surgery. So so we do it. So so atropine will cause an adverse effect 
okay in men with prostatic hyperplasia it will cause urinary retention why it will cause urinary retention because the detrusor muscle of the bladder okay will relax when the detrusor muscle of the bladder will relax the patient will not feel a pressure on the receptors present on the uh, detrusor muscle and then the signals will not go high up in the brain and definitely the patient will be unable to urinate okay it, it will have no feeling of passing the urine means no micturation so it it's an adverse effect it's important to remember okay and hyperthermia in infants hyperthermia in infants is really dangerous because atropine is causing decreased sweating when you are decreasing the process of sweating uh, okay one more mechanism of sweating you should know how do we sweat in your skin there are blood vessels okay when this lining of blood vessel which we call endothelium okay when this lining of blood vessel dilate when it's dilated okay then you sweat the blood flow increases and then you sweat but in case of decreased sweating for example in cold weather also or because of this drug or any other drug that is uh, decreasing sweating we we cause this constriction of constriction of smooth muscles of these blood vessels okay in case of constriction you are not letting blood flow more okay you are trapping the heat inside your body when you are trapping the heat inside your body the temperature of your body will increase that is called hyperthermia in adults adults can manage but infants cannot they can die okay they can die so this adverse effect profile is important okay so this was all about your um, atropine and one more thing regarding the atropine is you should know acha um remember this this world okay they can ask you that um about the contraindication of atropine so the contraindication of atropine will be uh, bph and this acute angle closure glaucoma okay you will not give in these two conditions atropine so it's a contraindication in glaucoma patients also another terminology that i want to tell you because there are people who might not know decreased sweating is called anhydrosis okay so you may see the word anhydrosis also in your mcq sometimes they don't write easy terminologies anhydrosis so just as increased sweating is called diaphoresis similarly decreased sweating is called anhydrosis so you can see an hydrosis within okay so what is the normal dose of atropine you should give to a patient it should be 0.4 to 1 mg okay you should know this because it is a it has a very bad side effect profile you should know this 0.4 to 1 mg never give this drug uh, to a patient who is a heart patient or who has a problem of arrhythmias okay there are so many patients who have problems of arrhythmias never give this drug to them it will cause increased heart rate so you can learn the contraindications by the adverse effect profile okay let's move to this part of the page okay soon after this uh, pharmacology lecture i will be teaching the biochemistry vitamins okay so we'll just take 10 minutes break probably and then i'll continue with the biochemistry class 
from the first aid and we will be studying B7. There is not much to remember in B7, but vitamin B9 and B12 are really important. So take the class online. Now benztropin, I told you it has this effect on the central nervous system, very important extremely important central nervous system okay so the patient with parkinson's disease this is a therapeutic use it is asked in previous mcqs in your exams remember this um therapeutic use of benztropine so it's a good mnemonic park my benz like benz is a car name okay so uh, it's a good mnemonic that you have to remember Parkinson disease with benztropine. So remember this is very important. Okay, benztropine. And also there is another drug name, but if even if you forget this name, that's not a big problem. But, but just remember the word benztropine, okay, uh, with the Parkinson disease. It is used in the case of Parkinson's. So you will not find a much, uh, much important knowledge about uh, this drug benztropine in your uh, <coughs> sorry in your book but def if, if like if I'll if I'll kind of want to know more about it the name the organ system tells you that it, it's working on the CNS that means it's working on the M1 receptors okay we have this M1 receptors on our central nervous system okay and now we do not use benztropine more. That is why I'm just telling you to remember it for the purpose of your exams. If you will be working in a neurology unit or you're working in, uh, you're a house officer in a, the internal medicine department, you will not be seeing doctors are using benztropine in case of Parkinson. The, the, the widely used drug for Parkinson nowadays is levodopa, okay? Levodopa and carbidopa. So you will be seeing these two drugs which are used widely and we will be studying levodopa, carbidopa in adrenergic drugs, okay? So our next topic will be adrenergic tomorrow. So just I'm telling you to remember these two names along, okay? So also um, you see this acute dystonia written over here. There is some um, there is some psychotic psychotic diseases, okay, in which you have these Parkinsonian uh, symptoms, okay. So in case of those, uh, that antipsychotic therapy also, sometimes they, they use this drug to, to treat this dystonia, okay? That is uh, irregular rhythm of muscle contraction, okay? Irregular rhythm of muscle contraction. The patient will have twitching and fasciculation, very acute ones, okay? So for a short period of time, acute, okay? So they can be treated by this drug also. Then the next drug, so remember this band stopping with Parkinson, but not used now, okay? Then we have this glycopyrrolate, okay? The glycopyrrolate drug is, uh, was not uh, used very much previously, and, but nowadays we are using this drug for the GI purposes more than the respiratory. So it is a parenteral drug, okay? You give it by mouth and then preoperative use to reduce airway secretion. So uh, it, it is used in the preoperative settings, but uh, again, not, not a lot, okay? They, they don't, in practical, in practical purposes, we don't see uh, glycopyrrolate being used to reduce airway secretions for preoperative uses. We don't see this drug more. We, we use these kind of drugs more because they are more acute and they have a uh, quick uh, threshold potential. So, but, but because it's giving in first aid, so you have to kind of remember. Also, you use it uh, when you give this drug IV and when you give this drug orally. So when you give it orally, uh, it causes, it, it, 
it can stop drooling and peptic ulcers why because you know glycopyrrolate is an antagonist it will decrease salivation so decrease salivation will stop drooling as well okay drooling means um, the dripping of saliva okay so that thing will be stopped then it it it's helping in peptic ulcers because it is reducing the uh, gastric acid secretion so when the gastric acid secre secretes more it it what is an ulcer what is an ulcer an ulcer is a breach in the mucosal lining okay we have these four layers uh, in uh, histologically we studied these four layers mucosa submucosa muscularis mucosa and then adventitia or serosa right so the mucosa is the innermost layer so the innermost layer is mucosa and when there is a breach there is a there is a break in that mucosa lining uh, the acid that is protecting the inside wall will not protect it more and that call causes this ulceration okay at first the patient will complain of a lot acidity inside non digestion of food and in 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 severe cases the patient will feel extreme pain extreme pain it is very painful so peptic is like stomach so it's stomach ulcer we have another duodenal ulcer too okay and duodenal ulcers are always in the first part of duodenum okay so like if the, the students who will be studying with anatomy with me they will be uh, studying that we have four parts of duodenum so only the first part is affected uh, when we have peptic ulcer uh, sometimes that in in later cases peptic can be diverted to duodenal too but but peptic is solely stomach ulcer so uh, by decreasing the gastric acid secretions that is hcl secretions uh, we are treating peptic ulcer too but again this is not the drug which we are using in our daily setup the drug which is used to treat peptic ulcer the best drug these days is omeprazole you all know uh, its brand name is rizek okay omeprazole there are so many brand names actually but rizek is the most common and cheaper one so you know we prescribe rizek to almost everyone so omeprazole is the drug which we use to treat peptic ulcer more just as i told you levo and carbi for parkinson so then we have this uh hy hyoscyamine and dicloamine okay they are also they are they are working on the gut so so they are not doing anything with the acid secretion but they are uh, their functions are more on the motility okay so they will kind of decrease the motility so in the patients who have irritable bowel syndrome now here i want to tell you we have two things we have an irritable bowel syndrome and we also have an inflammatory bowel syndrome do not mix inflammatory with irritable okay the criteria are extremely different in inflammatory you will see crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis but in irritable bowel syndrome you will see diarrhea and constipation even when you have exams nearby many students undergo irritable bowel syndrome it, it it the the factor that can cause this is the stress also so in this case when your bowel is hyperactive you need some drugs that decrease that motility effects and you can give antispasmodics in that case so there are a lot of antispasmodics but one of them lies under the category of muscarinic antagonist and they are hyoscyamine and dicloamine okay if you ask me uh, what i will prescribe for irritable bowel syndrome as in as the best anti spasmodic i will say i will give mebivirine okay so you will be studying all these drugs too in gi pharmacology we will study systemic pharmacology as we complete the the autonomic one okay so but you have to kind of remember 
Then we have ipratropium, tiotropium, very, very important drug. You will again study these drugs. It's complete mechanism of action, everything in your respiratory uh, pharmacology. So for now, you only have to remember that they are used in COPD and asthma cases, okay, because they um, dilate your... Um, bronchioles okay they dilate your bronchioles so you use these drugs uh, in those cases very important drugs they are ipratropium and triotropium so remember these drugs with copd and asthma patients okay and again one more important thing about this drug is they do not cross the blood brain uh, the blood brain barrier so they will not show cns effect so these are safe drugs too Okay, that's why we are still using these drugs now, nowadays also. They have a quaternary structure. And I told you that there are two structures, a quaternary and a tertiary. So when we talk about a quaternary structure, they, that do not cross the blood-brain barrier. But the tertiary amines do cross. So they are quaternary amines. Okay, they do not cross the BBB. So this is also very important to know regarding these drugs. Okay. But uh, there is a difference in between both of them. If I talk about triotropium, like uh, in the dosage, it is different, okay? So if, if you're giving triotropium to some patient, you will just give it one time in a day. So it is prescribed like once daily, okay? So this is a, an advantage of triotropium over ipratropium, okay? So you're giving it once daily. But if you're prescribing a patient ipratropium, you have to... Uh, like increase the dosage to maybe four times in a day, four times per day. So, you know, uh, it is easier to eat one time tablet than four times. So, so this is also a case. But again, nowadays we do use this, but this is not a first line or second line. In acute cases, the first line are always beta blockers, okay? In extreme chronic cases, we give corticosteroids so we will be studying all of them too when we will be studying respiratory pharmacology. So for now, you kind of just remember that we have two, two of the drugs that are muscarinic antagonists, okay? Then we have this oxybutynin, talifenacin, and talteridine. Very nice drugs among all of them. Um, oxybutynin has been asked in the previous MCQs. Uh, so it's, it's a previous MCQs of oxybutynin that has this genitourinary effect. And it is used to reduce the bladder spasms and urge urinary incontinence in the case of overactive bladder. So what they're doing is they are relaxing your bladder muscle. The detrusor muscle is relaxed. When the detrusor is relaxed, no contraction, no urge, no micturation, no problem. Okay. So there are females. There, there is a problem with females in older age because they give birth to babies. So in, when they get older, their bladder becomes overactive because of excessive stimulation. Um, those females that give like uh, birth more, like, like lots, of, lots of giving birth lot to lots of children. So, you know, uh, multiple birth can cause the bladder muscles to lose their tone, okay? And in the older age, they undergo this overactive bladder, their sphincters also become loose. So, you know, uh, in those cases, you can prescribe these kind of drugs that have a greater effect on the genital urinary system. So they will cause less urge and less, uh, the, the problem of dribbling of urine can also be solved. So these are the drugs. But um, in clinical setup, this drug is given as a patch. It is an intradermal drug, okay? So I'm telling you these things because like you're studying this first aid of pharmacology with me and there are lots of important things that have been asked in uh, other, other exams apart from your NEB. You will, you will see more complex MCQs in other license exams. So, oxybutynin is, is, is comes under a transdermal patch, okay? It's not, it's not like a, 
a parenteral or an oral drug okay it is a to it is a topical patch so it 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 is less it causes a less decrease side effect profile iske side effects itne nahi hai so that is why okay if you will give a drug if you will give a muscarinic antagonist orally just as you are giving this drug orally it will cause dry mouth because it's 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 decreasing the salivation okay so the drugs that are giving given intradermally are because they absorb slowly they will absorb slowly so they will have a less side effect profile so so that is why in case of this this oxybutynin is also used more than other drugs okay then you have this drug scopolamine like very very important very very important like write down very very and it's very important scopolamine it has an effect on the central nervous system that is why it is helping you with motion sickness no need to remember anything more about scopolamine just remember scopolamine with the word motion sickness you will see this on secure for sure this is the most favorite one so here we have finished our muscarinic antagonist okay let me but you see uh, these are all muscarinic we have not studied the nicotinic ones we have studied the anti muscarinic agent we have not studied this ganglionic blockers and nmj blockers so so this portion is not given in your first aid so don't worry we will uh, uh, because it's it's important for your exam so i will touch this portion apart from gang uh, from first aid book okay so we will study this whole thing tomorrow ganglion regarding ganglionic and nmj and i will and i will uh, make this, this pdf for you and i will send it to you also so that you may learn only the important points that are very important for these things um, and after that i wanted to cover the acetylcholine synthesis but then i kind of remember that in this book we do not have nicotinic ones okay so you see the next page is sympathetomimetic so here from here adrenergic is started so before um before moving to adrenergic we will study the we will study the nicotinic and also we will study the synthesis of norepinephrine okay so we this the synthesis is also important because if you will study the physiology like this is physiology okay if you will study this um synthesis and how this norepinephrine or epinephrine is working and how it is like hydrolyzing and what what are the things that are going on at over at this particular level it will be easier for you to remember the mechanism of action and on and the therapeutic uses of drugs so just as i uh, told you regarding acetylcholine we will be studying this uh, too so here i'm like ending my lecture of the day and the next class will be at 5:15 or 5:10 okay so i will post a link for the biochemistry class so i am ending my lecture here now Hello, Hafiz. So, students, if you have any question, you can also ask me here, or you can while you're studying yourself, you can ask me in private, like in inbox also, and or in group also. It's it will be okay in both cases. Okay.